we're about ready to uh, to move on with our next speaker, who has come all the way from Iceland, where they are studying. Here's some Icelanders in the back there, as always. Um, they are studying Viking and medieval Norse studies, so very well read into all the literature. But today, they'll be leaving the literature behind and diving into the mud, the clay mud of Denmark, to be precise, and the mud of Leire, where we find some very weird things going on. So without further ado, Max, please take it away. Okay. All right. So to just introduce Max a little bit, because I assume most people aren't super familiar with Denmark, I'm going to stay over here. Yeah, good plan. <laughs> <laughs> about six kilometers southwest of Posto, the nearest large town, and it's about 40 kilometers west of Copenhagen. Um, our site brings us to Gamalaka, the royal seat of the Skjoldan dynasty, uh, and it's also known as the setting. Outlined in red, the stone uh, ship setting. Uh, here's an overview of the site. Uh, the dig site at Gemalaga consists of the ship shaped stone setting, an earthen mound called Kredahoy, and a cemetery like area between the two. They found a lot of bodies there. I, I wouldn't call it a formal cemetery by any, any means. Um, it's about, a, a, well, about a kilometer west of the ship setting and Klebehoi is another archeological complex with uh, seven Great Hall um, footprints spanning a time um, period of about 500 years. So that's where we're looking. At the burial complex itself, they found 55 total graves, 51 were interred, meaning buried, and four were cremated. Um, there's a little breakdown of a sex some of the skeletons, uh, just 11 of them. Seven were male and four were, uh, nope, four, seven were female and four were male. <laughs> and uh, they also evaluated that Klirahoy is the largest, uh, not the largest, the oldest part of the burial complex dating from the mid seventh century, while the ship setting is about uh, from about the 10th century. The grave that we are looking at is at the prow, the north end prow of the ship setting. It was excavated in 1953. And this is what the uh, archaeological report had to say about it, made by uh, Steinwolf Anderson. Um, the digs were ongoing there between the 1940s and the 1960s. Um, he found at the bottom of grave 55 a slender little man who, despite a couple of healed bone fractures, had badly deformed feet. Over him lay a strongly built individual, I suppose we can say a man as well, with the head chopped off and placed near the shoulder, as you can see in the um, diagram. His hands and feet were close together and were likely bound. This initially confused the archeologists that there were two men in the one grave. And since its discovery, it has begged the question, why is this the case? Here's what Anderson had to say about it. He said that the natural explanation for this double burial may be that the topmost man was executed and offered in connection to the lower remains. That emphasizes that only the latter had uh, grave goods with him. Indeed, it is not an overwhelmingly rich outfit, an iron knife, a whetstone, and a belt buckle of bronze with matching fitting. But with the addition of the thrall, he has just enough for the afterlife. So going with this uh, analysis, what do we know about funerary traditions? Uh, a lot of what I was looking at is built off of the account of Ibn Fadlan, uh, an Arab scholar who was traveling with Rus Vikings, who were probably from Sweden in the 10th century, which was the same time um, just about as this burial complex. Um, the key section here is that the dead chieftain's thralls were asked who will die with him, and they volunteer themselves on the day of the funeral. The thrall who has volunteered 
is given special treatment, served drinks, and taken care of all day by other thralls. They go from tent to tent and participate in a ritual fornication with the chief's uh, vassals, who each tell the thrall to tell their master uh, that the vassal is doing this out of love for the chieftain. Meanwhile, a sorceress, we don't exactly know her status. Some have um, theorized that she's a vodva, uh, called the Angel of Death, has prepared the shroud for the chieftain's pyre and places offerings on the ship, including uh, food and like horses, dogs. There's a lot going on. Um, and then a ritual occurs with a symbolic makeshift doorway where the thrall is lifted up and uh, carried back down multiple times and says, I see the um, chieftain in Valhalla. I see my parents. Um, and it's seen as like an, an approach of uh, the afterlife and their destiny. dedication to the chieftain as well as the doorway ritual has been connected to the classical concept of eros gamos which uh, comes from the greek it means a divine marriage um people who have written on this include Gro steinsland olaf sundqvist focus Ström, and others eros gamos rituals take many forms but the term is generally defined as a symbolic union often with fertility connotations but its manifestations in re in ritual usually involve deities in Ibn Fadlan's account, the thrall represents a Valkyrie in the role of accompanying or uh, escorting the chieftain to Valhut, and by the man of execution. Goddess Nana dies of grief over Balder and is cremated alongside her husband at his funeral. This is where I started veering off into crazy territory. <laughs> I think this has a lot to do with gender. Ibn Fadlan's account specifically describes a female thrall as the sacrifice in the case of the chieftain Rurik's funeral, but he does note that the offer of the sacrifice is extended to all genders. In a heteronormative society like Viking Age Scandinavia, how would this affect theories related to Euros Gamos and high status funerals if it is? considered to be a fertility ritual, a marriage ritual, that that sort of thing. I'd argue that it doesn't. Because the traditional understanding of Norse gender roles with, with women in charge of in and stokes, uh, women's uh, the domain outside the home, um, appearing in legal texts, and the um, prevalence of outstanding women in saga literature indicates to uh, scholar Carol Clover that the gender binary isn't actually determined by biological sex, um, but rather by um, personal agency. Um, she calls this the duality between the adjectives blothered and vatted. Uh, blothered is it just kind of implies like weak, but it also can be referred, used to refer to the female of a species of animal. And vatter is its opposite. <laughs> Um, Clover says that woman and man is a normative category, but not a binding one, meaning that um, by one's deeds, um, they can break out of it. You see this with uh, Un the Deep Minded in Luxtyla Saga. Um, and you also see this in the role of insults, in, um, which are used often to study Norse concepts of gender. Um, because of the concept of nid and erki, which is its sexual slander, um, accusing a man of being uh, unmasculine and of uh, participating in what's called receptive uh, sexuality. Um, the concept of nid and erki come up in sagas in law, uh, law texts like Raugaus and Gulafing, um, which is like its Norwegian counterpart. Um, so essentially what it boils down to is that Carol Clover would argue that this is more what the concept of gender looks like, that it is a spectrum between Blöder and Vater, which can be correlated with masculine and feminine, 
but aren't as strict a binary as we consider today. Um, and that this is a mas masculine ideal, um, but you do have to work up to it. Um, Clover's paradigm takes its cues from American historian and sexologist Thomas Lecoeur, um, who wrote the one sex, one flesh theory in his book, Making Sex. Physiological differences were well known in medieval society, naturally, but the male-female duality is considered two sides of the same coin rather than two separate uh, like entities, I guess. According to Clover, the category man is, if anything, even more susceptible to mutation than the category woman. For if a woman's ascent into the masculine took some doing, the man's descent into the feminine was just one real or imagined act away. The frantic machismo of Norse men, at least as they are portrayed in literature, would seem on the face to suggest a society in which being born male precisely did not confer automatic superiority, a society in which distinction had to be acquired and constantly reacquired by wresting it away from others. So essentially, this is establishing gender as a um, externally determined label, uh, similar to the emphasis on reputation and honor that we are seeing in um, the sagas and things like revenge cycles. This connects to the social hierarchy as laid out in Rikstula, um, which splits the society into, for lack of a better word, castes of Jarl, Karl, and Thrall. Um, thralls are described undesirably managing physical grunt work, uh, and it is, generally a dehumanizing um, a dehumanizing uh, category similar to modern chatter, chattel slavery um, and trading trading slaves trading thralls was a major in, income source in the Viking age um, we do not have to get into all that <laughs> um, as we also see in the sagas reputation honor and good standing are reliant on community perception of personal behaviors and deeds like I said, an externally determined uh, status. In their role as slaves, thralls have the least amount of agency possible. And if gender is reliant on personal power and personal agency, or masculinity is rather, thralls would be positioned as far away from masculinity, from fatr, as possible on social terms. So what does this have to do with the grave in Lyra? I would argue that the beheaded person who was tentatively sexed as masculine in grave 55 at Gemma Laka uh, can be read as a Yeros Gamos ritual as described by Ibn Fadlan without requiring the complication of reckoning the status of homosexuality in the Viking age. If the gender options are man or not man, or rather if the proper or legitimate marriage, even by proxy, is between a blother and a vater individual, then a thrall would be considered blother, and therefore it fill it it ticks all the boxes to be a proper version of this uh Eros Gamos ritual. So that is where I stand on Lyatha. Thank you. That was excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Incredibly interesting. I'm sure there'll be questions. So if you have a question, you know the drill, raise your hand, we'll have a look. Same goes for the chat. I'm sure there'll be questions there as well. There's a lot of concepts that I threw out. So I expect, I don't, I don't expect everyone to immediately everything oh that's fair enough can i uh if there are no questions to begin can i kick off how did you come across this grave in what context did you find it were you out looking for um norse concepts of gender and then you thought oh this is interesting or did you come across this first and then work backwards i had actually i read <coughs> carol clover's piece regardless of sex in the course and then we took a trip to laga just in general and we were at the ship setting and the professor was describing it um, and he, he basically just said, there's two men buried here and we don't know why. 
and we'd just come from reading the Harold Clover, and I was like, um, maybe there's something there. Maybe there's something. Yeah. Interesting. Um, do you think, so you said that the uh, uh, sort of, I guess, role-coded uh, individual uh, was uh, like beheaded and the hands tied around the back when the other ritually described, obviously they're not all the same, was more of a cremation one. Do you think there's like, why? Like if you just have any speculations um, or do you think it's important in any way? I think to some extent it has to do with the wealth of, Rurik, the one described in, in Fodland's account, compared to whoever is buried in Lyra at this time. Mm -hmm. um, Morton Varman, who actually is the professor I was working with, has um, written on the, uh, the like symbolic status of ships mm -hmm. in specifically funerary rituals. And um, he argues that basically in in lieu of an actual ship, which is a very valuable resource, um, ship settings exist so that you're still like in a ship um, because of your status, but uh, not, it, it functions as a ship, but it isn't a real ship because um, you can't afford to lose the ship essentially. Um, so I think that because there's no ship to be burnt in, uh, that might have something to do with it. But uh, yeah, that's as close as I can get with the information I have, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I was just wondering, uh, sorry, I was a bit like, overwhelmed by all of the graves of the dying. Yeah, sorry. sorry first. Um, I was wondering what the sort of context of like the grave that you've examined with the two people and with the, you know, any that were around them, if that's, you know, sort of any clues as to what's going on with the sort of, you know, burial area. Yeah. Max, sorry, would you mind repeating the question just for the chat? Thanks. Of course. Yeah. So the question is, what is the context of the grave itself? Um, so what else is going on in the area with all the burials? Because there are multiple there. Um, there are 11 burials within the bounds of the ship um, setting. There is one in like the smack dab middle. Um, but I couldn't find actual uh, records on that grave in particular. The uh, the the report was a little oblique about it. it. There were it only focused on very specific graves. It was interesting. Anyway, um, there are because this is like a graveyard area. There were a lot of other um, graves around it. Um, I took the inclusion of the thrall in this grave um, as since this is the most valuable grave good included in a grave in the within the stone setting that this is the like occupant of the ship i guess um right in front of it like right in front of the prow is two graves stacked on top of each other but they are separate graves which i found interesting um yeah, this isn't the only grave in the area. It's just the one that I um, honed in on, A, because of previous analysis by the archaeologists working on it um, and how the site was originally described to me, um, and partly because of the inclusion of the thrall in grave 55. And stuff. We had one question from the chat, which is quite... Uh... Meta. So if you think, you know, this is not my area, then please just say it. We don't have to go into it any further, but I feel I should I should read it. Um, so uh, Farmer Galga uh, asks for both you and Tom. So Tom, if you want to weigh in on it as well. Um, both of you have now mentioned how societal norms, but also metaphysics are not dualistic. Any thoughts on how it can be described or how it can be contextualized? One thing with Tom's is, and his, like the question that, um, I think it was Petr, or, or yes. asked yeah. what, uh, with clarifying what Tom meant by letting go of the concept of religion, I think it's, it's um, a very major way that I approach it, where instead of thinking 
of this as fiction, as belief. I think of it as part of the culture, um, where it's just, it is reality. Because we do the same thing in our in our culture where uh, it's just accepted as reality that there are uh, in the context of uh, my uh, presentation, we just accept that there are two default genders uh, and that variations branch off from them. Um, and so when incorporating, for instance, the one gender paradigm uh, into how I was uh, conceiving of this, uh, yeah, I guess I just kind of sat there and I was like, well, if it was my understanding that there aren't two flavors of people there's one flavor and you're either more flavored or less flavored. Right. <laughs> it's a very good way of looking at it. Actually. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. No, super. Thank you very much. Are there any more? We, we have like a few more minutes left because you were so perfect on timing. That, uh, if, if there are any more questions, now's the time to shoot. Otherwise, maybe, you know, quick toilet break. Or, oh, there is one. Yes. Good be on. The topic of... Uh, um, my brain stop. Uh, uh, no, on the, on the topic of like the the uh, how, how how in that field a lot of people assume two genders and how you can have different flavors and so on. Uh, I've heard a wonderful um, wording of it before, where someone mentioned that technically, as a society, we start out with four because you start you know, it's, you can easily say that is that guy a man or is he a boy. Because then you also you start with the boy gender and then you go into the man gender later and you can have I, I was very fascinated with your uh, mention of the uh, the side I forgot which part of it because I'm also writing another thing here Sorry. at the same time uh, the um, uh, how women would have to work a lot to be seen ma as masculine but yeah. men only have to fuck up once yeah <laughs> to be seen as feminine. Uh, and I don't, I don't have a cleverly worded question in here. There's, there's something in there, but I, it, it just became a deluge of thoughts. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, let's see. I, I don't know uh, if that the, the whole uh, man or no uh, boy, girl, man, woman uh, uh, plurality of uh, gender views would fit into the uh, uh, one body, one uh, one gender, or one body, one sex flavor uh, spectrum. Like how, uh, if that would be a fitting thing? I, I think that taking is... those two concepts and putting them together, I would argue that there's three rather than four. Oh. Either in the case that it, there is a, gen, a general category of just juvenile, mm. um, where one kind of hasn't, acquired a gender yet almost or in the case that the gen the gender category if we're going to make it a trinary yeah. <laughs> would be man boy woman because from what we see of um the roles of young girls um mostly as portrayed in the sagas which are post-christianization Mm -hmm. um girls are seen basically as like they're women in training but they have much of the same expectations as women mm -hmm. um and so there's less play around time uh before maturation into an adult i guess mm -hmm. and then uh, like there isn't a, as much of a change in expectations um between girls and women other than now you have to go marry and have children because you're old enough to do that. But otherwise, the rules are the same. Thank you very much. Just very interesting points. Yes. Uh, yeah, a lot to a lot to consider here, um, and super cool to be relating 
the theories that we're reading about that are very theoretical and then applying it on the ground and seeing how does that work together. So thank you very much. Really enjoyed that. Hey, okay, I think we have like uh, four or five minutes uh, uh, on our time. So if you quickly need to...